Well, good evening. I think what you don't know is I think in the Guinness Book of Records that has me vomiting across every ocean on the planet. <laughs> so, so. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be here tonight. Uh, one of the things that, draw, that drew me here was the fact that you had a countdown clock. And I'll go anywhere for, I'll go anywhere for a launch or a countdown clock. So. <laughs> Well, I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit tonight about the challenge of change and about the fact that change means so much and so different, uh, so many different things to each and every one of us in this room. So the idea that uh, change, what change means to me or a challenge is probably different uh, for everyone as I go across this room and look at you all. And maybe at the end of tonight's talk, you'll have a better alignment of what I consider change is all about and certainly what challenges are all about. It's, uh, it's easy to go and talk about uh, people having to change, and we usually get to it uh, by different mechanisms. Quite often, we are pushed into change, or pulled, and this is something that makes us sort of uh, just take the stuttering steps. They're not, uh, this is not the kind of change we really, really want. It's uh, something that's foisted upon us. And as a physician, I've quite often seen and spoken to people who have sudden changes in their medical status or in a loved one's medical status, and that is just trying to push them into some place where they never thought they'd ever be. Of course, then there are the people who find uh, the winning numbers to the lottery tickets. I don't know where they are. It, it really amazed me. Go down this one street in Toronto, and there's this, this soothsayer telling her fortune. And I've always wanted to go in there with a lottery ticket. But I assume if they were really good, they probably wouldn't have to say that they could tell the fortunes of everybody, because I think people would really want to know where they're going in life. And so people who stumble along with a winning lottery ticket, they stumble, and sometimes they actually go backwards and don't really go forward with any kind of change in who they are or what they can do with that. So the best way, I think, is to actually choose to do it. And by choosing to change and choosing to accept challenges and actually try to find them, we can actually find out who we really are. Because I hope that no one in this room knows exactly who you are. I don't yet. I turned 65 last year, and I'm still working on it. Because every challenge makes me see a different side of my capabilities, a different way of applying my knowledge and my experience. And if I look at the conventional way of looking at life, you know, the old thing, we have to have capacity, you have to have a skill set, and you have to have an opportunity to be able to show all that stuff off. But what happens with all of this stuff is that when we look at capacity, it's something that we define according to whatever the situation we're in. The skill set, the same thing. What do I need today? What do I need for the next four years? And opportunity, well, that's luck. But you know, sometimes we can actually make luck happen. When we look at all of that, this is all defined by what we know. We know there's a university. We know the courses. We can read the calendar. This stuff is all known, and it is very, very constraining. I went to university for 18 years without repeating one year. I felt that I didn't know enough, and if I had time, man, I'd like to go back. There's a couple more degrees I'd like. In fact, I'd like to come to Waterloo, for example, and do an engineering degree. I mean, there was so much... There is so much to learn. And my view in life is, if you learn it the right way the first time, you won't waste time. And so when I did 18 years of university, it was because I wanted to do it the right way. I wanted to learn from people that I had assumed really knew their stuff. I didn't know about the right stuff in those days, but I really understood the value of trying to learn to help me be better prepared. Better prepared for what? Well, it was really being better prepared for the known. The uncharted is all about the unknown. So how do we take a skill set that has been constrained by what we know and turn it around for us to be engaging the unknown? How then can we challenge ourselves to change? Because change is all about that movement into the unknown. How can we take that skill set? How can we use it? Is it good enough? How do we know when it's good enough? Do you know at NASA, when we're training for a space flight, we train so much of the time on what might go wrong. And that's all constrained by the known. It's constrained by somebody saying, well, this could go wrong, this could, certainly the batteries, they always go wrong. And you have to be able to take a battery compartment apart, right? The toilet, mm, messy. So we want to be able to fix that. The option of Apollo bags is really bad. And food, we all like to be able to know how to use the scissors to get into the plastic food so we can not starve to death. 
So there are various things that they're constrained by the known, by somebody saying, oh yeah, that's what might go wrong, so we'll train them in that. But you know, the fallacy of all that is you get into space, things sure do go wrong, but sometimes it's nothing we would ever think about going wrong. Like, we just couldn't possibly make a story up that bad. <laughs> And so when, when we train, we start to think, well, how can then we pass this knowledge on to the next person? Sometimes that knowledge can be transferred very quickly. For example, you land, in the, land from the space shuttle, and you're on the ground, and someone said, did you get sick? If you like this person, you'll tell them the truth. If you don't like this person, say, I didn't get sick. <laughs> and so if you really like this person, they say, did you get sick? And yeah, what did you take? And so you start going through all the things you did so that uh, you, they didn't work on you. They say, okay, I'm not going to try that. I'll try something else. And so every flight, try to pass that knowledge on to the next person or the next crew. The first time foam was registered as an issue, an issue with NASA, was after the flight that I was on. If you look at the report after our flight, there was foam had been hitting various pieces of the shuttle. In fact, there was a piece of the, just close to the reinforced carbon carbon that went on Columbia. It was like within an inch of that. And so it was like 134 foam strikes on the shuttle, and they said, okay, let's make this an issue, but how long did it take to get down the line? Obviously not fast enough. And it was a long time between 1992 and 2003. I mean, it's a long time between 2003 and 2007. It's a long time between 2007 and 2011. So every time a shuttle goes up, everybody's, they used to just watch when they throttle up, like the Challenger, and everybody watches when the space shuttle lands, but I can guarantee there are only three very bad times in space. The three most dangerous parts of spaceflight are launch and landing and everything in between. <laughs> so going into space, you know, it's to boldly go. And, and we, we, thank goodness, we're below the level of all these space junk that's around. So we're in low Earth orbit. But nonetheless, it really becomes very unknown to us. We see things strangely. Things that we thought we knew, we start seeing differently. We see things hanging upside down, for example. We see each other hanging upside down, and some people actually throw up when they see people sort of coming in and they're upside down and they're trying to come towards you. Uh, I didn't do that one. Uh, I did other things, but <laughs> this, uh, this person coming in. So that is the unknown, and how do you prepare yourself for that? How do you prepare yourself? Because each of us, in our own lives, really are, is on a voyage that's uncharted. Now, we can say in the broad sense, if we are doing something bigger in terms of going through an unknown forest or an unknown sea or the unknown space, we can say that grand adventure is uncharted. But all of our lives, we are actually going through life uncharted. I don't know about you, but I didn't think I had anything to say with being here. I mean, none of us really had to say of being born. I mean, none of us requested our parents, oh, please let me be. We don't, we, and we're not given a passport at birth, although in physician, uh, physician's terms, I really would like to have had a medical passport so I could put all those things in. It would be very helpful when patients come to me and they say X, Y, and Z, and I say, give me your passport, and I can see what's been going on the last 72 years. So we have an uncharted path for each of us. So we need to have that skill set for sure. We need to have the opportunity. And we need to be able to understand that if we just be constrained by the known, we won't necessarily have that right combination as we go through life. We have to be able to embrace and understand what it means to embrace change and to engage change. So spaceflight gives us that opportunity, extreme opportunity, to see things turned upside down. Now, I'm just going to spend a minute because, of course, it's all about us. It's all about us. We go into space because it's about us. Some people like saving things because it's about us, what, it, what good it is for us. People sometimes are in the environmental uh, activism role, and they say, listen, the only way I can get people to listen to how we are able to save the species is because we have to say how important the species is to us. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about us right now. Because in spaceflight, we learned something about us that we've never learned if we stayed here. Now, I don't know how many people in this room knows that, you're, know that, uh, knows that their eyes rotate in their heads. You're looking at me like I'm a weird person here. <laughs> but your eyes do rotate in your head. Not like an owl, but if you look in the bathroom mirror, and you can do this alone if you want, shut the door, you can see the iris around your eye, which is brown. You can see all these little spots on it. 
and you look at one of the spots and you tilt your head to the left, your eye counter rolls in the opposite direction, the same number of degrees as your head tilt, if you're normal, in the opposite direction. <laughs> and that's why when you lie down on a couch, lying down like this, and you want to watch television, you have to turn your head up about that far to be able to see things because your eyes don't roll all the way around. They only roll part way around. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's muscle, there's fat, there's all kinds of stuff. So it slows the eye, the globe down. So you can't rotate your eye completely around. But that reflex is set up because there's part of your inner ear that senses a sudden shift in gravity. You tilt your head to the left, you don't have to think about it, your eyes roll to the right. You trip over something, your hands go out. You all know about that reflex. Well, guess what? After 48 hours in space and there's no gravity, what does your brain do? Ixnay, no more reflexes like that. So what is a pilot going to do coming back? Well, quite often, you know, when we're taught how to fly, you're looking all over the place, you're looking around the corners. What would you do if you come back from space, you start turning your head like this? Your eyes are not rolling, they're going sideways. So this is a really difficult part of landing the shuttle. <laughs> Also, they follow us into the shower. Not right into the shower, but pretty close, because we're walking around like this. We lose complete midline tone. If I was offered a thousand, I used to say a thousand American dollars, but today it would be a loony, at the end of the bed, and had to do one sit-up, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I have seen 350, well, 250 pound men, I'll be kind, on beds after the space flight, and they've been left after all the testing's been done, and suddenly they start rolling off the bed. <laughs> I've seen astronauts, have been behind astronauts, who have rental cars, driving like this. <laughs> so this is about change, about what we learn about ourselves, that we can change without us even knowing it. And anybody in this room who says they can't change, let me at them, because there are things that we can do that make us better, because we have the ability in our brain to make that change, but with three caveats that I'll give you tonight. One is we have to want to. We have to have that disposition to change. And energy is a huge thing. I don't know how many more things are going to be put in your day. I mean, if you tweet, you blog, you do this, you do that, when do you have time to eat and go to the bathroom? I mean, they don't talk about that in the real world, but you have to put it all in. And people sometimes, the energy gets dissipated. It gets, they can't start the activation energy, they have inertia, they just can't get to it. So they may have the disposition to want to change. Your body certainly has the capacity to do it. We know the brain has this plasticity and it can change. We have a day down for every day up in space where our bodies pretty well get back to where they used to be. But the brain needs to have it repeated. If I give someone a talk on change, it's not going to change that person in an hour. It may put a little light bulb on, but after that, walk out of the room. Who's going to repeat that message? Unless you go to the web and see the speech over again. <laughs> the idea is that you need to repeat it not necessarily in the same form. You need to repeat it looking at it differently. You need to repeat some of these things that will help you change, that will give you that ability to, to reach into your brain and say, hey brain, reconnect. The brain is biologic tissue. It is not a computer motherboard. So you have to be able to make repetition happen. Those are the keys. So when I try to sort of think about these things, look at the world from space, I can adapt pretty quickly in space. I can flip this around in case none of you really knew what you were looking at. It is the area which is in strife right now. You can see Libya is fading off to the far left uh, past Egypt. I can flip things around when I'm in space flight, but after I come back to Earth, unless I'm reading upside down all the time, that skill dissipates. But what didn't dissipate for me? The evolution of me as a person. Not because I can read upside down, not because I can look at maps upside down, but because of what I saw, how I saw it, but the most important thing is how I wanted to use it. It wasn't necessarily coming back. I did space medicine research for 10 years as the head of an international group looking at how blood flow in the brain changed in spaceflight, how the nervous system changed that gives us symptoms of the same type of things we see in Parkinson patients or stroke patients, spinal cord injury. We see these things in astronauts when they come back and yet they recover. So many more things to learn. So how am I going to use this knowledge? Well, you know, as I get on a little bit in years, 
I realized that I wanted a different type of a vehicle for this perspective I had in space. To be able to see the planet upside down, see writing upside down was okay. It's kind of fun, you know, kids like the story of being like Spider-Man hanging off the wall and eating, you know, that's really good stuff. And I can entertain them for a while about how to use the toilet in space. But it comes down to it, real meaningful things that come from it, things that actually will make society move, is to be able to share this knowledge in such a way that you can improve the lives of others. And so what I did was, for a while, I was looking at my footprint. This isn't it. Some lawyer asked me once if I'd, what it was like on the moon. I really had to reassure him that I hadn't been to the moon, and neither had any other Canadian, uh, that it was going to be a while. Uh, so I looked at my own footprint and the kinds of things that really were important to me whether it was the environment, leadership, all those kinds of things. It was very important for me to say, okay, what are you going to do now as a physician, as a scientist, as an astronaut, photographer? I trained at the Brooks International, at the Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, California to get another piece of paper. 18 years wasn't enough. And I, I went out to, into the field with these large format cameras to take pictures, especially of the Canadian Arctic over which we did not fly. I wanted to take pictures to be able to show people that we are living on a planet and how wonderful this planet was. This planet is unique. Show me a tree somewhere else. I went up to the north part of our country, at the edge of our country, the edge of Canada, Ellesmere Island, and there is this ice shelf sitting on it. You might recognize this from El Gore's movie, The Inconvenient Truth. This picture, a little crisper, was taken before <laughs> taken before the big crack, one of the two big cracks, came through this ice shelf, and the ice shelf is now split. This ice shelf lived for, well, about 10, 100 times, uh, I guess it was about 10% of the size now, it was 100 years ago. But it lived as an ice shelf around our north for a long period of time. The interesting thing to me was that there's life within these turquoise pools. So I found myself all my life, wanted to take photographs of things in an artistic way. And then I wanted to take things to explain the science. So that turned me into now developing a terrible organization called the Roberta Bonder Foundation, where we're going to infuse art with science and science with art. We're going to help people, all age groups, be able to train their cameras better on the environment, to understand it better, to understand how to take more artistic photographs, but to understand what are the elements that teaches about science, especially environmental science, within that photograph. Because I still change. And when I look at the picture of me when I was younger, and I was wearing a pith helmet with the binoculars, and I start thinking about the kinds of things that were important to me then, about the unknown and the uncharted. I look at myself now, grown up a little more, always wanting to change with the unknown. And that I wish for all of you. Engage, enlighten, and be enlightened.